speak. Let's just pray for him, shall we? Father, we do thank you for your living word. And we pray, Lord, that this evening you will speak to us, not just through this liturgy, but through the words that Dean has prepared. Lord, we ask that you will open our hearts to receive, Lord Holy Spirit, what you're saying to each one of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. wanting to do for us and the third one here we are (laughs) the third one um, is what Jesus wants us to do for each other okay let's have a look at number one so Jesus as he is actually the opening verse in chapter 13 to me kind of really struck quite a chord in me when I first was looking at these scriptures verse one speaks of Jesus in the sense of he knew that his hour, his, ha- his hour had come to depart from the world and to return to his Father. Now Jesus is unique in that he knew when, where, and how he would leave this world. He also knew where he was going. He was going back home. Unlike us, Jesus had been there before. He knew where he had come from. And he knew where he was going. Verse 3 says that he had come from God and was returning to God. Identity matters because it defines who we are and how we are going to live our lives. It shapes our behaviours. Jesus' behavior on earth was centered on who he was and where he came from. His whole life and ministry was secure in the knowledge of who he was, where he'd come from, where he was going. We might want to sort of reflect and think about the things that shape yours and my identity. I can remember um, when I first started sixth form, there used to be lots of sort of teaching and sort of things they used to give us as teachers to do. And, um, and they, one of the training sessions we went on, and this bloke, um, I have no idea who he was, but he asked this same question many times. And it was, who are you? Who are you? If I was to answer you, ask you that question, how would you answer it? Who are you? And where are you going? Jesus is also unique in that he, he had both love and power without limits. Again, verse 1 speaks of Jesus having loved his own who were in the world and he loved them to the end. <clears throat> Having love without limits is an amazing thing. And speaking for myself, I'm not sure that I can love without limits. I think this is a really big ask. I think we all have different levels and thresholds of love towards our family and our friends. And you might want to think about perhaps your own love limits towards others. Jesus' love towards us is unconditional and it is without end. How do we know this? 
Well, Judas, sorry, Jesus knew that Judas would betray him, that Peter would deny him, and the rest of his disciples would run away. Yet he still washed their feet. And as we shall see later on in this talk, this was a very hum- humble and loving act. This is an example of Jesus' love without limits. A demonstration that he loved them and you and me to the end. And Good Friday is clearly a demonstration of this love without limits. It's slightly echoing here, which is kind of annoying. (laughs) You and I need to remember that Jesus' love for you and me is more than Okay, I'll just read that bit again. Jesus knew also that the Father had put all things under his power. So why does this combination of love and power without limits matter? Let's just think about this for a, matter, for a moment. Generally, if you and I had power without limits, what kind of people would we be? Just think about the power that Jesus demonstrated during his lifetime, for an example. If we had that kind of power, how would we have used it? Perhaps we may have responded differently to the temptations of Satan during Jesus' time in the wilderness, and indeed during his lifetime. Most of you will be familiar with this phrase, after all, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. Yet Jesus has unlimited love and unlimited power, but he was not corrupted. Power without love leads to selfishness and is dangerous. Love without power leads to helplessness and frustration because you can't help people in their situations but only sympathize with them. Jesus has both power and love without limits and that led to a life of service. Jesus didn't use his power selfishly, he used it to glorify the Father and he used it to show his love to those who he met. And he's still doing that today. Have you received or experienced Jesus' love for yourself? We'll be coming back to some of these questions sort of later on. There will be a time of ministry at the end of the service, and I would encourage you to just reflect on some of the questions I'll just kind of throw at you and to, you know, see where there'll be an opportunity. We'd love to pray for you at the end. Okay, second point, what Jesus is able and wanting to do for you and me. And this is the main part of today's um, sermon. The washing of feet was a very ordinary act and an event in Jesus' time. And especially during these public meals when you're gathered together with people. Now think about this yourself. Some of you might even have done this today. Um, You've you've been invited around some friend's house and they're going to give you a meal. So some of you, you know, you may have had a bath or a shower before you came and joined us this evening. With a bit of luck. <laughs> you may have put on some aftershave and perfume, put on some nice clothes. 
And the same was the case in Jesus' time. But whilst people in Jesus' time travelled to the meal, and especially if they were walking, the guests were likely to get their feet dirty because they were wearing sandals. And because the tables and seating arrangements were close to the floor, not kind of this raised situation that we have here, it tended to expose your dirty feet. Clearly, this wasn't a good look whilst eating with your friends or perhaps people you're trying to impress. So slaves were employed to wash people's feet prior to sitting down. And generally, there were two types of slaves that were used to um, feet wash. The second lowest slave would untie the sandals and remove them, whilst the lowest of the lowest slave would wash the feet and the guest's feet. And you might want to remember that John the Baptist claimed that he wasn't worthy enough to untie the sandals. So he was saying that he was the very bottom slave. That's in Luke 3.16. So what do we see happening in this account of John, John 13? We read about the last meal that Jesus would have with all his disciples before his death. And this meal was hastily and secretly arranged. There were no slaves at the door to wash their feet, so everyone simply sat down. No one was willing to wash each other's feet. No one was humble enough to serve others. So what does Jesus do? Well, he gets up, he removes his outer garments, he became semi-naked, and takes a towel and invites each of his disciples in turn to have their feet cleaned. I was thinking about this sort of before I came across my notes, now here they are. The idea, how would we feel about the King of Kings kneeling down before us? You know, would we feel uncomfortable? Would we feel entitled to the King of Kings washing our feet? And so before I came to the service, I've I sort of kept on coming back to Colossians 1, verse 15 onwards. This is quite an important scripture for me. I kind of said this at my baptism here a couple of years ago. Because this Jesus is the same person that Paul talks about in his letter to the um, Colossians. You might just want to kind of think about this in this act of washing feet. Because Paul is talking about this person Paul describes Jesus as the following. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over creation. For by him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and, and for him. Now, Paul goes on and describes even more about Jesus. And it's, you know, Colossians 1.15 onwards is an amazing, amazing piece of scripture. But that's what we're seeing here. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. If you want to know what God is like, well, there's the image of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. This love without end was prepared to get down on his knees and be the lowest of the lowest slave for his disciples and for us. This image of the invisible God was prepared to get on his knees. 
And Jesus, this image of the invisible God, is still coming to us humbly today. He doesn't force himself upon us. He doesn't force himself into our lives. Instead, he comes to us in humility. And he asks us, would you like me to do something for you? Well, do you? Do you want Jesus to do something for you today? We often feel, we often feel like we have to do something for Jesus first. And we often make the mistake that we get salvation by serving <coughs> others first. Often that's called works. Well, we don't. And this is often a stumbling block for many people. And it's a stumbling block for many Christians, and it may be a stumbling block for people in this church. This is an example of pride. Instead, salvation is given to us freely. You and I can receive this salvation. It is unmerited. We don't deserve it. And our good deeds can never be enough to earn it. Have you received this gift of salvation yet? Are you willing to receive it? Or are you going to respond to Jesus like Peter did? You shall never wash my feet, was Peter's response. Like all disciples, Peter would, would have been deeply embarrassed and shocked by Jesus' act of humility. In essence, Peter was too proud to serve others. He didn't, want, he didn't offer to wash the feet of other disciples. And he was too proud to be served. He didn't want Jesus washing his feet either. And Jesus' response was, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. In essence, Jesus is saying to Peter, unless I wash you your feet, we can't have fellowship together. We can't be friends. We can't go any further together in our relationship. It's not what we do for Jesus that makes us a Christian. It's what Jesus does for us. So let Jesus do those things that he wants to do for you and me. Let us not set the agenda with Jesus. Often he wants to come in to do ordinary things in our lives. So let's just let him do it. So just let him do what he wants to do in our lives. So having been rebuked, Peter goes from, you shall never wash me, to wash all of me. But Peter doesn't need his whole body washed. Once you've had a bath, you don't need another one because you are already clean. You just need your feet washed to remove the dirt you have picked up, perhaps during the day. And so it is with salvation. Once you have been saved from God's wrath, through faith in Jesus' death and resurrection, no act can cleanse us further. It is permanent and complete. We are totally clean in God's sight. You are forgiven and can be a, and begin a greatest friendship you can ever possibly have, and that is with Jesus. From then on, we need to repent, say sorry to God for the sins that we have picked up each day, the dirt we pick up on our feet, as it were, on our travels. Again, I was sort of thinking about this. I wouldn't say this is totally clear in my head, so it will probably come out interestingly. So what we're kind of saying here is putting our faith in Jesus and asking for repentance is, is a kind of a, 
cleansing. And I think we've kind of sung about that, or it's been in the liturgy this afternoon. And it's saying that we're inviting God into our lives. But as we go on in our lives, we pick things up. We say things, we don't say things, we do things, we don't do others. And what we're kind of saying here, this is a bit like the dirt that we pick up on our feet. Now, sometimes we tend to think of repentance as being like, oh, I don't really want to repent. And I'm not sure God's forgiven me. But certainly if we, when we've been looking through the book of Romans, and I think this is what I'm sort of talking about today, is that once we've given ourselves and we receive salvation through faith, we are forgiven. And those little daily repentances, I think, as I'm trying to work this through in my own life, is a, it's basically like saying sorry in response to the things that I've kind of done against God. In the old sort of Lord's Prayer, it talks about trespasses. And I'm going to get this wrong now. We, we, it talks about we trespass against God. Yes, we might commit sins and say things and do things to each other, but we are trespassing, we're sinning to God. And it's not that God hasn't forgiven us, that we've lost salvation. It's just that we kind of need to say sorry to him. It's almost like we're saying sorry to someone who means a lot to us. It may be think about someone in your life who's really, really important maybe a husband or wife, your parents, it could be anything like that. And imagine saying something uh, or doing something that is wrong and may hurt them. And so what do you normally do? You kind of say sorry, and you don't say it because you feel obliged to do it. You do it because you're kind of grateful for their love and because you don't want to hurt them. And I think that's what repentance is. And that's why we're called to, you know, to come to God on a sort of daily basis. It's kind of like, oh, I've got to say sorry to God again. And that's kind of not really it, is it? It means that we haven't really grasped the price that Jesus paid on that cross or how much Jesus loves us. And I think that's what repentance is. That daily repentance is like, oh, do you know, We're not perfect, we get things wrong, even though we wish we didn't, and we were perfect. But just those things that we do wrong just happen sometimes. And you go, oh, why am I still doing those things or saying those things? I think that's what true repentance, almost like a heart cry. We haven't lost our salvation because of those little things. Those are the little bits of dirt that we're picking up in our lives. And so we need a foot wash, as it were, to remove them. Do you want all the dirt that you have picked up in your life washed clean today? Or do you just need a foot wash today to say sorry for those things that we've picked up on our journey the last couple of days? Okay, the final point, which is a lot shorter. What Jesus wants us to do for each other After Jesus has washed each, each of his disciples' feet, including Judas, and in that passage we um, read out, Jesus knew what Judas was going to do, and he washed his feet. So even after that, Jesus then talked about the significance of what took place. I'm just going to read out verse 12 to 15. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. 
now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. In essence, Jesus is showing us what lordship is. And I say, that passage when I wrote out, I read out in sort of Colossians, Bear in mind, Jesus is above thrones, powers, rulers, and authorities. Okay, he is the king of kings. Everything is under his feet. Jesus is showing what lordship is. And it's not lording it over other people and bossing them around. It's not about who is first. Real lordship is serving others. And Jesus used this foot washing demonstration to contrast his attitude towards lordship to those of his disciples. And in Luke 22, 24, we read about, we read about this, and if I read my notes properly, we read about which of the disciples was considered to be the greatest. They wanted to see who was the number one disciple. And Jesus was listening to this. Now, Jesus' demonstration of lordship, i.e. the washing of the feet, was about servanthood, serving others. This act of washing feet isn't a ritual that is only to take place on Monday, Thursday, but it is a life of serving others in response to Jesus' gift of salvation. So how do we serve others? Often they are very small and humble acts of kindness we do for one another. They don't always have to be very big showy things. So it could be spotting people who are lonely and spending time speaking to them. It could be about spotting people who are slipping in their faith and fellowship and stretching out a loving hand and pulling them back in. It's about being aware of those around us and helping them in their time of need. That's what a Jesus-centered church is about. We are to emulate him, serving one another in a lowliness of heart and mind, so seeking to build one another up in humility and love. And if we do this, we will be greatly blessed. Again, I have been spending some time on this today. Um, I think some people are very good at serving others, but not very good at receiving help from others. And I must say that that is an example, a sin that I have. Again, that's another pride issue here. And some people can find sort of, some people would find it difficult to serve others. In a way, we kind of see in the Peter scenario here. But we're not always, Peter didn't want Jesus washing his feet. And I just wonder if there's anyone else in the church that suffers from this type of sin. You know, quick to help others, but not really receive help. That's something that I've been kind of working on, and it is, it's hard. Okay, in summary. Okay, Jesus' identity was centered on who he was and where he was going. Is your identity and life centered on Jesus? Jesus' love for us is without limits. He loves you and me to the end. Have you experienced this love in your own life yet? Do you want Jesus to do something for you today? Jesus is willing and wanting to cleanse us from our sins, to remove all the dirt we have picked up in our lives. Have you received this gift of salvation yet?
would you like to? And Jesus wants to follow, wants us to follow his example of serving others. Do you need to repent for the times that we have shown we have been slow to follow Jesus' example? Would you like Jesus and the Holy Spirit to help you in your service to others? As I said, there is a time of ministry at the end of the service, and um, you know, it'd be great to pray with you as we continue through this service now of Holy Communion. I just let's just pray. Let's just, I'm just going to finish with a prayer, really, and then yeah, let's just take it from there. <laughs> so, Father God, we I just lift up these words to you, and we pray by your Spirit that you would come and fill this place. I pray, Lord, that you may release within us the freedom to receive your gift of salvation. And Lord, we pray for not our own agendas, but we pray that even now you would be working in us and help us to draw alongside you in your agenda for us in our own lives. Amen.